welcome everyone and in this video I'm going to share with you everything I've learned about photographing roe deer, all the tips and techniques I've used in order to get my best pictures of these amazing animals. Roe deer are quite widespread in the UK. You can often find them in mixed countryside. That can include farmland, grassland, even on heathland. Now the location I come to is, it's largely farmland, but it is a nice mix and there's a woodland as well. They can be really, really faithful to an area. So once you know they're there, try and look for more signs, try and look for footprints, uh, pathways, even droppings, and then try to watch them as much as you can. If you can do this, then you can start to build up a picture of their habits. There's no doubt about it that the hardest part of photographing roe deer is the field craft. And it can take years to learn how to get close to these animals and how to adapt in any given situation. Now for me, the roe deer I photographed down here, it's always seemed that movement has been the biggest factor in my experience. So I've always tried to move slowly, to obviously not draw attention to myself. But this year I just really made a conscious effort to slow down even more. Uh, so I'd be very, very careful and conscious. I'd use like the slower heel to toe walk. I'd even look around slowly. Uh, just assume you're always being watched basically. It's a, a bit like the government. And when I got to boundaries, I actually slowed down even more. So when I got to the, the corner of another field or the edge of a hedgerow, for example, I'd just go super, super slow, almost like in slow motion. Sound wise, I do try to be very, very quiet and you never know what other animals and birds might be around. But it seems to me with these deer, they're generally less affected by sound. And I think that might be to do with the fact that there is a couple of working farms quite close by. Uh, there's also a track, so you can quite often hear voices and other sounds. So I think possibly they just become accustomed to that. And when it comes to the wind, this is always something I try and pay attention to. I always do try to approach the deer downwind. That means that the wind is coming from there. Them towards me. Now I think the odd deer maybe didn't seem too concerned by this but I always try to do it anyway. Now what about clothing? What do I tend to wear for roe deer photography? Well in the past I always wore a camouflage hood, on a few occasions I even wore a ghillie suit but now I don't do any of that and that's something I'm going to stress in this video. So yes, if you go down that route, you probably will be able to get pictures of roe deer, but the problem is at some point, they're probably gonna figure out that you're there. Uh, you're gonna surprise them more. They're gonna be more alarmed and you're just gonna end up with pictures of the deer on high alert. If you wanna spend more time with the deer and you wanna get pictures of them acting naturally and looking relaxed, then I honestly think it's better that you let them know you're there. I know this might seem a bit counterintuitive, perhaps goes against what you've been told, but if you use this type of approach, then even if the animal does become alarmed when it gets closer, it's done that of its own choice. You know, you didn't push the issue. And if it happens that a deer comes across you fairly frequently and you don't do anything that's perceived as a threat, then hopefully in time that animal is gonna become more accustomed to your presence and it's gonna accept you a lot more. So this spring I tried a new approach and I took off the camouflage hood. Now I did usually wear a hat and a pair of gloves. This is largely because it just gets quite cold here in the spring. And I tried to wear the same outer layers of clothing every single time I came down here. So the same green trousers, I usually have these boots on, and the green jacket. And this was in the hope that the deer would at least at, at least to some extent become familiar with how I looked and my general outline. Now, as well as that, I was hoping that they would become a little bit familiar with my scent as well. well I think it's difficult to know exactly how they're reacting to various smells in the area, how close you are, how old the scent is. But I think the bottom line is, if you're quite regularly walking through their territory and they've not been put off, then they're probably gonna get used to your scent to some degree. Now, I've realized over the years that a lower approach is generally a better one, but that can be a little bit difficult when you're hand-holding. So I'm usually hand-holding for my road air photography. So so if you, if you are low down, you have to stop and you have to stay in one position because the deer spotted you, for example, then that can be quite uncomfortable. 
to hold that position for a period of time. Enter my secret weapon, which is the folding chair. And it might seem like something so simple, yet it's honestly had a massive difference in improving my roe deer images this year. And I've been using this when I've been trying to let the deer come to me. So basically I'll try and get myself into a position where I want to be, and then I'll unfold the chair, settle myself down, and just wait. And it's great because it's still low down, but because I'm sat, it's much more comfortable which means I don't have to worry about holding the position for long periods of time. It minimizes movement and I can even put the camera in my lap as well if I want to. An actual fact, the first time I used this technique, put the chair down, got settled, I already had some good success. <laughs> All the images I've taken this year of the road here have been with the Canon R6 and the EF 400mm f5.6 lens. And this lens, because it's so small, lightweight, I find it really flexible. Uh, if I was to use my big lens, I'd really need the tripod. And I just, for me, um, I just find that really restrictive. It just doesn't work for me when I'm trying to get closer to road here. The tripod just gets in the way. The lens is so heavy as well. So this is just really nice and flexible, it keeps things easier. I do have it on the strap when I'm approaching the deer uh, so I can just pull that camera up to my eye when I need to. Now that said, this lens isn't necessarily the best in low light, so I do have to be a little bit careful, like make sure that it is focusing accurately, and sometimes I might change some of the focus options, the autofocus options in the camera. I have also tried the extender on occasion. This just kind of really magnifies all the problems uh, and makes them worse. So it's not ideal, but of course it is gonna give you more reach. So I did try this on a few sessions for the road deer. I tried to restrict it to situations where there was more light. So if it was really bright sun, then I'd be more likely to try out the extender. The R6 has made a massive difference in photographing the road here, and that is largely because of the electronic shutter. And in fact, it's one of the main reasons that I brought this camera was just for the silent shooting. Now with my old camera, the Canon 1DX, sometimes the sound of the shutter, if it got anywhere close to the road here, would be enough to send them scarpering, um, even on the so-called silent shutter. Uh, but with this electronic shutter, just the ability to take those pictures without making a sound, without spooking the deer, has just really increased my hit rate. Now I also think the combination of the electronic shutter and the IBIS, the in-camera stability, I think that's really helped as well in terms of getting sharp images and being able to use slower shutter speeds. The eye focus on this camera can be pretty amazing at times and I've used it for a lot of bird photography and even some birds in flight. It can be really good but when it comes to the road deer I've just, in my experience so far, it's not necessarily been the best option. So in this kind of habitat there's, there's often lots of distractions, grasses, uh, things in the way and it's, it's often difficult to get a really clear view, I have a clear view of that eye. So I've actually found I've been using a spot focus a lot of the time and that's been pretty consistent. Um, but I would like to try the eye focus more. In terms of camera settings, the deer are usually more active around sunrise and sunset. So that can mean you get a lot of uh, light and shade, particularly if there's big hedgerows and maybe some tall trees. So the light can be quite changeable. So I prefer to use auto ISO because it just makes it easier, less to think about. I think you can deal better with that changing light. And I prefer to use aperture priority because that ensures you'll always get a well exposed picture, even if the light levels get very low. And I usually set a minimum shutter speed on the camera as well. That can range from anything from about 
250th of a second to a thousandth of a second, possibly higher. And now I will use the exposure compensation. So depending on the situation, I'll try and look at the background and add some plus or minus compensation depending on the situation as it's unfolding. With such tricky subjects and potentially difficult lighting, I think you have to be willing to experiment uh, with different options and find out what works for you. Now in terms of the focus, I'll generally have it on the AFC, the servo on Canon, the continuous autofocus. And I'll either be using the eye focus or the spot focus. If I'm in a tricky situation, I'm feeling like the focus isn't working as well as I want. Uh, maybe I've got the extender on, maybe it's just been a little bit inconsistent. Then I will actually switch to a one shot focus, a single shot focus. That can work better sometimes, give you a bit more reliability. Now sometimes I will try to improve the image quality a little bit as well so this might mean lowering the shutter speed to give me a lower ISO or perhaps using a smaller aperture just to increase the sharpness of the lens a little bit um, but I don't think it's a great idea to, to fiddle around too much Rodeo is already so difficult to photograph and if you spend too much time changing your settings then you're probably going to end up with no pictures at all so I think when it comes to Rodeo it's often best to sacrifice a bit of image quality in order to get the shot now I very rarely take binoculars with me when I'm out and about for photography, uh, but these have now become a standard part of my Rodeo kit. I will always take them with me. And the reason for that is that you need to know at any given time where the deer are in terms of making your approach. And that's quite common when they're at the other side of the field, maybe the, by a hedgerow, for example. They can just blend in so well. So good idea just to have the binoculars, field binoculars, and I always have them around my neck when I'm making an approach. One of the best things about photographing roe deer is you never know what's gonna happen. I think that anticipation is what makes photographing this subject particularly exciting. So you can sometimes have a really, really quiet day where not much happens, and then another day can be one of the most, the best experiences you ever had and it can very quickly go from one to the other and if you get to spend a lot of time with your local roe deer then it can always throw up some surprises I remember one particular evening which was a really productive session and, and there was actually two groups appeared so not just one group but two groups and I thought in the area I probably had uh, maybe three books at the most and I actually realized there was four books in this, just in this one group alone. So there's definitely more books than I realized. My main aim with this project was always to photograph natural behavior as much as I could of the roe deer. And I could only really do this if the deer were relaxed and they weren't put on edge by my presence. So with this technique, I'd basically, I'd try and predict where the deer were likely to go. I'd get myself slowly into position, low down in the chair, and then wait for the deer, hopefully to come closer to me. And this did work pretty well on a number of occasions. And by doing this, I just ended up with a lot more time with the deer and watching their behavior. I saw, saw so much behavior and interaction, individual deer um, grazing and shaking themselves, shaking their ears. It's quite a common thing, which is interesting. Sometimes scraping the ground, just fantastic to watch. I saw a lot of interaction as well between deer, between individual deer, different sexes, different ages, sometimes deer chasing one another, the books play fighting. Now in terms of the books, they were very, very interesting. They tended to be more wary with me, harder to get close to, uh, but I did spend a good bit of time, probably with three books, but mostly two different ones, an older book and a younger one. And again, just some of the behavior in the way that they would kind of investigate me when they knew something was there. They kind of sometimes prance up and down, like you could see they were trying to size you up 
Sometimes they'd raise the front leg, they'd raise the hoof or stamp the hoof a little bit. You could see them sniffing the air quite a lot. This is quite common, is they put their noses up and sniff the air. Sometimes they'd lick the nose as well because I believe that actually heightens the sense of smell. And on a few occasions I did get rumbled by a book, usually by the, the most mature looking book uh, that did bark at me and turn around and take to its heels. But thankfully that didn't happen too many times. And with different ages of deer and different groups perhaps, you're gonna get a multitude of behavior throughout the year. Photographing roe deer is a huge challenge and you only really get better at it uh, by getting out there in the field and learning from experience. And one of the biggest mistakes I used to make was trying to take a picture too soon. Um, so if I'd got closer to a roe deer and perhaps even the roe deer had spotted something and was looking up, I'd still lift the camera and I'd take a picture. And looking back on it, that just seems a bit stupid now. Uh, but basically that would be enough to send the deer fleeing and that would often be the end of that photo session. But now I view it differently. I try and think about the deer being relaxed. If a deer's grazing, for example, it lifts up its head to look in my direction. I'll wait until it puts its head down again. I'll wait until it's relaxed before I make any more movement. And that can be difficult to do, but you just have to resist that temptation. Again, you're trying to gain the trust a little bit more. And also I watch the ears a bit more now as well. That can give you a bit of an indication what the animal's thinking. So if the ears are like directly pricked up directly towards you, then perhaps it is suspicious. Um, and also if the deer has ears once forward and maybe once further back, then that can indicate a bit of uncertainty. I have to say the wind was a constant challenge. So I was always trying to approach downwind, but in this location and particularly where I am now, uh, sometimes it can swirl round. So my approach, might have been perfectly downwind. Then I'd get closer to the deer, the wind would swirl around, change direction, and it would send my scent towards them, which is just, it's so frustrating. So it just means that when I'm approaching, particularly from a certain direction, I just have to be careful and try and keep checking on the wind direction as best I can. And then I might need to readjust my approach to approach from another angle. But without a doubt, my biggest problem has always been being rumbled by another deer. So that means I'm approaching a certain deer that I want to try and get, hopefully get pictures of, but there's another one or two deer nearby that have spotted me and they are the ones that have raised the alarm. And I've lost count of the number of times this has happened. Um, I may be approaching one or two deer and they're in a good position and they look relaxed. Everything's going really well and no problems. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, there'll be another one or two deer that appear they're staring right at me and then they raise the alarm and that's the end of that photo session so again this really goes back to making sure that you're aware of the deer in the area you know using the binoculars is a sensible approach and just being aware if there's any more deer that might actually be watching you and I had many many failures over the sessions I did between sort of March April and May time and that's just normal for this style of photography. You just have to accept that. You're not always gonna get the pictures you want. You just have to really keep persisting and keep learning. I think the more you can learn, the more you're likely to be successful. It's not a coincidence. It's not just about luck. But the successes I had far outweighed the failures. And this year just had some of the best experiences I've ever had with Rodeo in my entire life. There were some sessions where everything just came together. I'd got myself in the right position. The deer were coming towards me. They were relaxed. I was just able to photograph in, you know, photograph the deer just going about their natural lives. And there's no better feeling. Now I have learned a lot about roe deer this year, but it's just a fraction of what is in this book by Mark Nicolades, The Life in the Year of a Roe Deer. Absolutely fantastic book, amazing images that just speak for themselves. But the information about roe deer biology, about their habits, how to get close to them, is absolutely incredible and the storytelling as well. So I highly recommend this book. You can also get lots of information online, which Mark has put there with many years of experience. You can find that online at allaboutdeer.com. I'll put a link to that in the description below this video. And also just to say a big thank you to Mark for just the information he's provided has really helped me in my own roe deer project this year and his passion just always comes through. And a special thank you as well to the people that helped me, some of my YouTube viewers who helped me with suggestions on getting better pictures and how 
how to habituate roe deer a bit more, particularly Stephen who gave me some lots of fantastic information. Massively appreciate that. Thank you again. And if you enjoyed this video, uh, check this video up here, which is all about getting close to wildlife. Uh, roe deer might be in there, but other stuff as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Thank you.